you will, turn with me this morning to John chapter 21. There is a 21st chapter in John. Lord willing, we're going to look at it today. I know we were in 20 for quite a while. <clears throat> you know, getting to the end of the Gospel of John is kind of making me nervous as to where we're going to go next. I told someone one time that preaching through books in the, in the scriptures takes some of the guesswork as to what you're going to preach next. You know, you know where you're going to be, so you don't have to spend five days out of that, you know, previous week of study time trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to go, you know, preach next? So I'm getting to that place where, okay, now what? All right. But <clears throat> there's still chapter 21. So let's look at chapter 21. I want to read, we'll do a little bit of reading here uh, this morning. I want to read through the 14th verse um, to try to set up some of the things we want to share with you this morning. Chapter 21 of John, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed, him, showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon in bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and die. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. All right, there's a lot. I know there's a lot of reading there. And as I read through that again, I thought, mm, you take a little bit more than you could chew. But... Um, I wanted to read all of that because some of the things we want to share today, Lord willing, we need all of that to be able to set it up. Okay, so that last verse we just read tells us this is the third time that he appeared to the disciples. There's, I think, an important point we need to bear in mind uh, from that verse. It says it's the third time that he appeared to his disciples, but remember, as we've studied through this, through John chapter 20, we've learned that the first appearance of the Lord was to Mary Magdalene alone. Then, we've also discovered that he appeared to the other women. Okay? Then, uh, it says, uh, we learned from Luke chapter 24 that he appeared to Peter. And then he appeared to the two on Emmaus. That's right. And then he appeared... Uh, to the disciples for the first time as a group, he appears to them that night that he rose from the dead. And then eight days later, again, it's the Lord's day, uh, he appears again to the disciples, especially to Thomas. All right, then we have this occasion. So there's a lot of appearances, but the, but the text here says this was the third time that he appeared to his disciples. Just remember, that he's, this is, I believe anyway, this means he's appearing to the disciples as a group, okay? 
And also another point I want to bear in mind is that sometimes when the Lord here in the scripture refers to his disciples, he's referring specifically to his apostles. Okay? Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and those women who went to the tomb there to anoint the body of Jesus, they were disciples. But they were not disciples in the same sense that the eleven were. Okay? So just... just just bear that in mind. That was important for some things that we, you know, we had um, developed out of John chapter 20. But anyway, be that as it may. So this is the third time he's appeared to his disciples. Now, I remember one time many years ago, it must have been, it must have been 20 years ago, I was sitting out on the porch with uh, Elder Eddie Hicks. Y some of y'all remember him. And he, we were talking about uh, this time where the, the disciples go fishing and he mentioned how that many ministers in his circle had said that Peter was not doing what he was supposed to do in going fishing, okay? But he believed that, uh, that indeed he was, you know, he, he was not in error anyway. He was not in error whenever he, uh, he went out fishing with the other disciples. Now, uh, I've read here recently where there's some others who think that he was in error for doing this. I'm going to maybe err on the side of charity in that regard, but I'm going to present to you the possibility that, that he was. I really don't think he was, but for the sake of some points that I want to make, we're going to, we're going to uh, hold out the possibility that he was. Okay, so now remember who Peter is. Peter, as you recall through reading the Gospels, he is, he's the guy who seems to be very impetuous. He's the one that opens mouth and inserts feet, okay? And practically, you know, every time he opens his mouth, it's really to switch feet. But sometimes, you know, he opens his mouth and he gets it right, okay? He's that kind of guy. All right, he is bold. See, like at least when the Lord is present, he's very bold. He makes statements that you know that you're like, okay, well, he's a man, sort of man. Until later on, he proves just, just you know, what kind of man he really is. Okay, but nevertheless, you know, he makes all kinds of boasts. He does. He makes all kinds of statements. You know, he uh, he's kind of the impetuous guy. But as you read through the Gospels. He's presented usually like first. When a narrative is given where, you know, it's, it's he and the other disciples, he's usually listed, listed first, okay? Just like he is here. Now, it may be because maybe he is more, sort of the chiefest among the apostles. On the day of Pentecost, who is it that we hear speaking? Who's... Whose uh, presentation, as it were, is recorded on the day of Pentecost? It's Peter's, right? All right, but nevertheless, be that as it may, Peter, as, as you recall, the night that the Lord was betrayed, the Lord told the disciples, all of you will be offended at me this night, or because of me this night. And Peter's like, Though all men should be offended, yet not I. Lord, I'm willing to die for you, okay, or with you. And then you remember what the Lord told him in, re in response, in reply. He says, Simon Peter, this night the cock is not going to crow twice before you've denied me three times. Peter said, nah, no way. That's not going to happen in a million years. And it happened in that very night. He denied the Lord three times. Okay? So, you got that in the background. Just keep that, you know, sort of back in the back of your mind here as we, as we go forward in this. All right? Now, I think it's interesting, or it was to me the first time I ever read this. You know, when you read back in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, you read the statement here, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. 
Now, if you are reading through the Bible and you're reading it like I've been reading it here for, for quite a while, you know, from beginning to end, and you're reading it and you're thinking, you know, trying to, trying to make this all chronological. When you read Luke chapter 24, verse 49, that statement, tarry ye here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power on high. And then you get over here to John chapter 21 and you're reading that he is in, that these disciples are in, at the Sea of Tiberias, which is in Galilee. You're thinking, well, they're in error for being in Galilee. However, you know, you have to read these. Don't read the Gospels necessarily in chronological order. You know, don't, don't think that the way it's presented is necessarily chronological because if you do, you're going to be like Brother Carl said this morning, you're going to be as, as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. Okay? You're, I mean, you're going to be all discombobulated. You're going to be like, oh, I, cannot, I, I can't figure this out. What came first? You know, the chicken or the egg? You know, that sort of thing. But, um, but at any rate, don't get trapped in the thinking all right, this came and then this came when you're reading like Luke chapter 24 and then John 21. Jesus told the disciples before he was crucified, when I am risen, I will meet you in Galilee. Okay? He told them that. In fact, you remember whenever the women go to the tomb to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus on the third day, we read how that uh, that the angels told them he's not here, he's risen. Go and tell his disciples that he goes before you into Galilee. And then the Lord Jesus personally tells you know the women, tell my disciples I'm going before them into Galilee. Then you also read in Matthew chapter 28, and I've got these verses if you're interested in what they are. But he tells them in Matthew chapter 28 uh, that he is to meet them, or he will meet them, in a mountain. There's a specific mountain or a mount uh, that they, they talked about. I will meet you there. Okay, so now, we've set all that up. Peter says, he's in, apparently in Galilee. He's at the Sea of Tiberias. These disciples are with him. They're there. They're in Galilee to meet the Lord. But you remember that from the time that he met with the disciples the first time and when he met them the second time, a full week has gone by. They're in Galilee and they're waiting. Perhaps, at least I don't read it in the narratives in any of the Gospels, the Lord doesn't tell them when he will appear. He doesn't say when he will meet them. He just says, I will meet you in Galilee at this mount, okay? They're, they're there, perhaps. They've been there maybe several several days, and the Lord hasn't appeared yet. So Peter, he, he says to his fellow disciples, I go a-fishing. Okay, so now, let's just suppose that Peter is reflecting back on that scene where he has denied his Lord three times. When he had vehemently said to the Lord, I will not do that, I will die for you. And then he fails, and he fails miserably. So that's in the back of his mind. Now just suppose for just a minute, you're Peter, and you have denied the Lord Jesus three times. You failed him miserably. And it may not be in the same particular you know, scenario like you know, as described there with Peter. Maybe, maybe you've committed sin. Maybe you have, you've come to the knowledge of the truth. You've, uh, you've, you've come to understand how that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and he paid the debt you know, that you owed, that you, uh, uh, that you have been washed by his blood, and then you go out and you sin presumptuously. You remember the, the psalmist David in Psalm 19, I think it is, you know, he, he begs the Lord to, uh, to keep him back from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. You know, which implies that that is a very strong possibility that that actually could happen. And perhaps 
That's happened to you. Maybe you have sinned presumptuously against the Lord. You've sinned against the truth. And now, you know, you feel so terrible about it, you know, that you feel like, well, I am of no further use in the kingdom of God. I cannot be useful. I've tainted my, you know, my, uh, uh, my behavior. I've, did, I've tainted my, my uh, reputation. I've tainted, you know, my, my, my usefulness. I, I cannot be useful in the kingdom of God anymore because I've done this thing. Or I've acted this way. I'm no longer worthy to be called, you know, a son. I'll just seek a servant's place, perhaps. Maybe Peter is at that place where he had been called to be a fisher of men. We'll get to that in a minute, you know, Luke chapter 5. But because of his denying the Lord the three times, he feels like perhaps, and I say feels like, okay, because the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked, who can know it? He feels like I've been disqualified. I can be of uh, no other use, any further use in the kingdom of God. Praise God, Jesus will set that straight later on. We won't get to it today, but Lord, you know, Lord willing, we'll get to that where he does restore Peter. In fact, you know what, having said that, you remember what he said Jesus did to Peter Simon Peter, uh, the Satan hath desired thee that he might sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. All right? When, and when thou art converted, notice he says, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. We've already seen through our study of John chapter 20 how easy it, uh, it is for us, our being weak mortals that we are, how easy it is for us to forget the things we ought to remember. Jesus told them time and again, I will be crucified. I will be buried. And I will rise again the third day. He told them that numerous times. Right over their head it went. You know? Yes, right. In one ear, out the other. It doesn't gee haul with my, my understanding of Scripture, my understanding of, of all the things that's taught by my, my scriptural teachers, you know, that sort of thing. And so, you know, we just let that pass. I don't understand, so I'll just let that go. It's easy for us to forget, for whatever reason. It's easy for us to forget. And here again, Peter perhaps, again, I'm just going to say perhaps, Peter forgets what the Lord said to him when he says, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Okay? The Lord told him there, you're going you're gonna to fall or you're going to fail. But you'll be converted. You'll be restored. And when that happens, strengthen the brethren. Okay? Boy, we got to hang on just even to the little things. You know, the, one of the prophets said, despise not the day of small things. Those little things like that, when thou art converted, we need to hang on to those kind of statements, right? I mean, there's a lot of meat there. There's a lot of encouragement in those little statements there. We just don't let them slip. Nevertheless, Peter, Peter just says, okay, well, I'll just go back to my old trade of fishing. Again, supposing that what he's doing is in error, but I just go back to my trade of fishing. And so that's what we see him doing. But notice something else. Again, this is just allowing for the possibility that he is in error. Notice how that his error leads others to do the same. You've heard me say this time and again. Our personal sins do affect others. Okay? We said here not too long ago how in Psalm 73, whenever the psalmist there, he is envious of the wicked. His, his knives had well nigh, his steps rather, had well nigh slipped. Okay? And he, he, talk, he, he ruminates in his mind how 
you know, how the wicked, they prosper and they have it all so good, you know, all that sort of thing. And, and we followers of the Lord, I mean, we've got it so bad, you know, and all this sort of thing. But he said he would not even, I'm putting words in his mouth perhaps, he would not even dare mention anything to the Lord's children lest he should offend any of them. You can read that Psalm 73 about verse 15 thereabouts. He was concerned that if he gave voice to the things in his mind, he could cause others to go astray. And he would dare not do that. How we need to be very careful ourselves. You know, I was thinking about this this morning, how, you know, parents, you're always modeling before your children behavior. And while you might be trying to teach your children the way they ought to go, the way you behave in front of them consistently does a whole lot more teaching than, one, than what you say with your lips. Isn't that right? I just, I do this a lot of times. I hear my children say things. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's me all over again. They got that from me. Yeah. You know? Or their behavior towards certain circumstances. I see that in, you know, when they do that and I'm thinking, oh, they shouldn't do that. And I'm like, they got that from me. You understand? Yeah. What we do is a powerful witness to other people. It can either be a powerful witness and influence to good or to bad. You would read in Hebrews chapter 10, I think it is, how we are as saints of God, we are to provoke unto love and good works. We are to consistently do that. That's just, that's not just in word. Okay? Do as I say, not as I do. You know? We are to do as we say, or do it. Yeah. Anyway, you understand. <laughs> but we... We are to influence them by our behavior as well as by exhortation. Okay? So it's very important. Peter, if he is in error, he's leading his fellow disciples in error. All right? But again, I think, with old me, I think he's not in error. In fact, I tend to think that Peter, a lot of things have changed Okay, over the last week, couple couple weeks. Prior to the Lord being crucified, the, the disciples, they accompany the Lord everywhere they go, everything they need, I start to say want, but that's not understood correctly anymore. Everything they need is supplied. I mean, there's not a there's practically not a day that goes by that they don't have something to eat. They've got clothes to wear, all that sort of thing. Everything's provided for them. But now the Lord's gone. You know, he was in their physical presence daily. Now he's not. Okay? Things are changing. In fact, the Lord here, just just the very night that he was betrayed, he told them, you know, while you were with me. Lacked you anything? And they said, no, Lord. And he says, now I tell you, get your purse, you know, and get, get a sword, get all these kinds of things. Things are changing. Peter, all right, now he's at the Sea of Tiberias. He's a fisherman. Churches aren't yet established, okay? Churches aren't, aren't established to, you know, to supply their, you know, their needs, so to speak. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm telling you here this morning, that's proper. Whenever a church, even today, when a church is not able to supply their, their pastors uh, the things that they need, it is proper and right for that pastor to work a secular job to, to sort of meet, uh, meet the difference, to, to make up the difference there that the uh, church can't supply. And there may be times as in the case with the Apostle Paul, where there are circumstances that necessitate 
they're working with their own hands. You remember how that there's several times uh, in the letters to the Corinthians, Paul mentions this, and especially in, in 2 Corinthians, about chapter 13, I think it is, where he says, you know, I have labored, you know, with my own hands. I have provided those things that I've needed, and I've robbed other churches to do you service, that sort of thing, and yet I'm still going to do that. And why does he say he's going to do that? To cut off occasion of others who say, well, he's just in it for the money. All right? Sometimes circumstances require that a pastor do that. I'm very, I'm very thankful. The church here has been very gracious and generous with myself. There's, in fact, there's, there was several years here we were able to do, to do this without having to work a secular job. And perhaps when, when children are, you know, when they fly the coop, we might do that again. We don't know yet. We'll see. But nevertheless, I'm thankful for the generosity of this church. Y'all have done very well over the years that we've been here, and I'm very thankful for that. Anyway. It's right and proper for Peter to do this. I need to eat. Okay? I know how to fish. So I'm going to fish it. But you know what? It's very interesting to me that he goes out fishing. He doesn't catch anything. I mean, can you imagine? You're in this boat and you're casting this net. I don't know how heavy these things are. I remember, you know, casting a shrimp net. It wasn't t terrible, but I guess after about the 150th time, maybe it might be a little bit tiresome. All right? You cast this net, you draw, haul that thing back in, and all you've got to, you know, for your efforts is a few sticks, maybe a license plate, you know, uh, you know, the, the, a, a portion of a beer can, you know, or whatever, whatever, you know, you drag up off the bottom. And you do this time and time and time again. I don't know how many hours he did this, but he's all, he's all night doing this. Okay? You caught nothing. You recall there was another time that we have in Scripture where Peter was out all night. Peter, James, John. Uh, seemed like there was somebody else. Uh, maybe Andrew. They're out all night long fishing. The Lord comes to the shore. He gets in the boat with Peter. They launch out a little while, a little ways. And he tells Peter, cast out your net. Lord, we have labored all night long and caught nothing. There ain't any fish around here. Wait a minute. Nevertheless, at your command, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. And you remember the result. The Lord tells you, go fish. <laughs> all right, and what happens? There's a, a load of fish. You remember there was another time he told Peter, hey, go out and cast a line out there. And uh, the first fish you catch, it'll have a coin in its mouth. You know, the Lord has a way of directing the fish where they need to be at the right time. I mean, God is a God of providence, ain't it? I mean, he's, he's got this whole thing rigged, as it were. I mean, he knows how and does. He controls you know, things, and he can providentially, he can steer things in such a way so that Benefit comes from it, okay? And here in this particular case, you know, Jesus tells Peter, no, cast your net out again. Oh, we've labored all night, we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, it's your word, we'll do it. And then there's this big haul of fish, okay? I mean, a huge, I mean, the, it was so big that, the, you know, the, uh, the weight of the fish was tearing the net. And they, you know, Peter says, hey, James, John, y'all come on over here, y'all help me out here. My, my net's tearing. And then you remember how the Lord says, I will make you fisher of men. In fact, but Peter told him, he said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinner. You know, I, I'm not worthy to be here in your presence. The Lord tells him, come with me, Peter. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Now, Peter had that experience. And now here the Lord, you know, here, here he is again. He's out fishing, same kind of circumstance. We have worked all night long. And then you got somebody out there on the shore who says, hey, have you caught anything yet? Have you any meat? Got anything to eat? We ain't got a thing. Oh, well, cash it out on this side. I could imagine 
Well, I know what I'd say. What good is that going to do? Whether I'm on this side of the boat or on that side of the boat, it's not going to make any difference. But you know what? Peter, he doesn't even give any inkling that he's thinking this way. He just casts his nail on the other side. Okay, I'll just do it. You know, I know it doesn't make any sense. I'm just going to do it. You know what? Sometimes the Lord calls us to do things that don't make any sense. But our, our job is not to question why, but to do it until we die. All right? Just do it. The Lord's way is always better. Amen. The world is going to say that doesn't make any sense at all. What difference does it make whether you cast your net on this side of the boat or on that side of the boat? The Lord said cast it on this side of the boat. The Lord knows best. Right. Amen? Amen? I mean, He knows best. So I'm going to do what the Lord says. Right. So much of the time, the Lord's people do what they think makes the most sense. There's a way that seemeth right unto the man, unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. And that proverb is mentioned twice, exactly as I said it just then. Twice it appears in Proverbs. You reckon the Lord is saying, pay attention to me. Saying to us, lean not unto your own understanding, but trust me. Peter, he cast the net on the other side. And then he's got this haul of fish. Now, he's, it's 153. Now, I remember one time going to the Okefenokee Swamp with my dad and one other guy, and we caught, I think it was between the three of us, I think we caught about 300 that day, okay? Not with a net. But it was all day, you know, we were catching one, you know, after another. Just the right time of year. Now, the disciples, they labor all day, all night long. They have caught nothing. Can you imagine the frustration? And you're tired. You know, you're maybe even discouraged. I, I know I'm doing the right thing. I'm in the right here by doing this. And yet, the fruit of my labors I'm not seeing. This is all I've got to show for it. It's an empty boat. You know, tired, sweaty, smelly guys in this boat all together, and we've got nothing to show for all our work this night. You know, we said that Peter was so told of the Lord he would make him a fisher of men. You know, ministers of the gospel, that is what we are, fishers of men. And the way we fish is by preaching the gospel. And there's a lot of times in the experience of a minister, he may preach for long seasons and not see any fruit of his labor. He may not see any evidence that he's catching any fish. There's, there's nothing to show for his labors. No baptisms. You know, when I first came here, I don't know, it was several years before we had any baptisms at all. Then we'd have a little season there, we'd have some baptisms, then another season where we don't. You know, you have those seasons like that where you don't have anything to show for your work. Or seemingly. And I'm going to say seemingly because it's out there. If you're preaching the Word of God, if you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it does have effect either positively or negatively. Either way, it does have effect. Okay? In fact, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 2 speaks of that. Paul does. Nevertheless, there may be long seasons where you don't see any fruit from your labor. Not catching any fish, as it were, or men, or women. Minister can get very discouraged. One time, I was asked to fill in at a church down in Jacksonville, Florida. I'd been there several times. They were without a pastor at the time, and, and uh, I had been there several times to preach, and they had even entertained calling me as their pastor. Um, but anyway, I, I preached there several times, and then, you know, I went on. 
I went on to other, other areas. In fact, it was not long after that that I came up here. And, you know, as far as seeing anything positive out of my efforts, I didn't really see anything. And then about 20 years later, I get word through somebody about a particular brother there that was, ha that was having some very difficult time. And I happened to be there, quote unquote, happened to be there at that time. I don't have any idea what I preached, but whatever it was, it served to greatly encourage him. He was very discouraged. He was even entertaining leaving the church altogether. And whatever it was I said in that discourse changed his mind. I never knew that until 20 years later. Peter, James and John and Nathaniel and, and uh, Thomas and two other disciples, nothing, 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 nothing. Could very easily say, what's the use? You know, I'm just going to hang up my hat. It's my, all my efforts are in vain. And then the Lord, you know, he comes, he's, he's kind of setting this up. He's setting this up. I think providentially they don't catch any fish. All right. So that the Lord can really make this miracle remarkable in their mind. Have you any meat? No. You can call it a thing. <laughs> Sorry for sharing stories. My dad and I, one time, we went fishing at this kind of secluded pond. We went out there, we got in this little John boat, you know, a little 12 foot aluminum boat. And so, I mean, you're in close proximity together. He's on his end, I'm at my end. He's catching fish. One after another, nice, big, you know, bluegill, you know, and, and so forth. I'm over here with my, my same bait, same rigging, 12 feet away, not even 12 feet away, nothing, not even a nibble. That went on all day long. You can imagine the way I was feeling. Of course, Dad, he had that notorious thing he would say in an experience like that, he'd say, well, son, you just weren't holding your mouth right. <laughs> Made me so mad. I don't know if y'all ever heard that. Or not. Oh, yes. Boy, oh boy. <coughs> you know, but here, the Lord, I think, is has providentially, he's sort of drawn a line in the proverbial <coughs> sand for the fish. No, y'all stay just out of reach here. All right? I want to teach these boys a lesson. I want to really emphasize in their minds how much they need me. Right. Okay? And then the Lord says, cash it out on the other side. They do. They haul in this great haul of fish. It's so heavy, you know, that, oh man, the net doesn't break though. All right? Like it did the, the previous time. And in that instance, John, who is identified here as that disciple whom Jesus loved. Remember, like six times he says that in the Gospel of John. He recognizes, hey, Peter, that's the Lord. You remember, we had a similar situation like this before. You know, right? I mean, that I would think he's coming to his mind. And then Peter's like, it's the Lord. You know, it's interesting. John loves the Lord Jesus Christ. They both love the Lord Jesus Christ, but these two men are very two distinct people. Right. They have different personalities. And John, John is, he is quicker to discern the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. But Peter is quicker to react. Right. Oh, is the Lord girds on his, uh, his fisherman's coat and into the water he goes, I'm going to see the Lord. You know what I mean? 
two distinct individuals. Did one love the Lord more than the other? Probably not. Probably not. But the but we see here that Peter he girds on his coat. And by the way, when it says he's naked, he's not naked like we think naked. Okay? He has some undergarments on. All right? They have <clears throat> Anyway, just suffice it to say he's not naked in the way we 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 think that he is. All right? Anyway, he girds his coat on, he jumps in the water, he's, he's going, going to shore. They're only about, uh, if I remember right, they're only about 100 yards off the, off the shoreline, okay? Easy swim for an experienced fisherman. He goes, he's going to see the Lord. All right, when he gets there, what does he find? He already finds fish on the coals, <laughs> right? And Jesus says, but wait a minute. Come on, bring up the fish you caught. Come on over here. Let's put them on the fire too. We'll, we'll cook them too while we're here. Of course, they had way more than they needed, right? 153 fish. That's a lot of fish. 153. You know, some people try to, try to figure out what does 153 mean? It means it's 153 fish. <laughs> I mean, right? It just means it's a lot of fish. He got that in one cast of the net. This wasn't, you know, I cast and then I catch one, cast and then I catch another one, you know, that sort of thing, and it goes on all night long. No, this is 153 fish in one cast. I can imagine perhaps the disciples saying, Lord, where were you in the first of the night? You could have saved us all this work. Sometimes we have to get to the end of ourselves, don't we? Sometimes the school of hard knocks, as it were, trains us to depend on the Lord Jesus. If we're going to be fishers of men, if we're going to be successful in the kingdom of God, if we're going to demonstrate or show fruit for our labors, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Lord in our lives. We need the Lord's blessing. That's the reason we see so often in Scripture how that when the church prays, you know, they're filled. We read in Luke chapter 11, I think it is, how the Lord you know, tells them you know, how that if, the, if your father, which is in heaven, he knows, you know, if he's good, is he good? Is the father good? Is God our father good? He is good. How much more shall your father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to them who ask? If you lack wisdom, he says, he'll give it to you liberally. And he won't upbraid you for asking. Just ask in faith. Believe him. Believe that he's God. Believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You need strength to overcome sin in your life. Go to the Lord and ask him for strength. You need, we can't do this ourselves, right? All our efforts by ourselves are vain. We can't do it. Paul said, we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us. We can't just, you know, say, you know, I'm going to grab a hold of my bootstraps and pull out my boots and I'm going to get out there and I'm going to get the job done. You're not without the Lord. You, the, the Jews were able to rebuild the city of, uh, the walls around the city of Jerusalem in 56 days, I think it was, or 52 days. I forget now which one it was. Somebody can help me. In 52 days, record time. They were able to do that with just a few people because the Lord blessed. It was obvious. The people around, even the enemies of the Lord knew the Lord blessed them to rebuild those walls. We need the Lord. If anything else in this lesson comes out to you this, this morning, comes out to me, it's, it's that. We need the Lord. We need His help. Everything on our own is vanity. We need the Lord and His blessing upon our efforts. And as Paul said, at least two different occasions, be not weary in well-doing. But we shall reap if we faint not. May the Lord add His blessing.